Hey guys, it's Nurse Janet, Nursing the Truth. I hope everyone is having a great day. So yes, it's been a while since I've made my last video. I've been very busy working at the hospital. Um, also for the Labor Day weekend, I went and took my parents out to the beach um, for their overdue 50th wedding anniversary. So if you do the math, you're trying to figure out how old I am, right? So anyway, yes. Um, Always here for the truth-seeking show. Um, <clears throat> I've been trying to figure out some new topics to talk about. And if you're new to my channel, uh, you know that I like to uh, talk about um, Christianity, the contradictions, the church history, um, just different spirituality things. So, as I've been out of the church for over three years, um, it's quite interesting um, how you stumble upon things here and there that you never knew before. And each day, it is like a rabbit trail, um, and it just takes you down the road. So, um, what we're going to talk about today is Philo of Alexandria, okay? Um, Philo came from, from a very wealthy family. Um, you know, his father uh, was a very wealthy man, and they had ties um, to um, the uh, Mark Antony family. Um, so, anyway, the rabbit hole goes very deep. So, what we're going to talk about today is... Philo's account of the ascetics of Egypt. You know, like I said, uh, everything comes from Egypt, um, whether you want to believe it or not, that's passed down to us. Not to say um, that, you know, not giving any booze to Samaria or the Mesopotamian region. But uh, Egypt is where my heart is, so we're going to stay with that. So anyway, if you uh, want to read some of um, Eusebius's work, because this is quoting from Eusebius, you know, he did write the, um, uh, the Evangelon uh, preparation. And you can also get this on ccel.org and it's called the Christian Classics Ethereal Library. So, it's at chapter 17 of the ccel.org and it talks about the account. Now, I'm not going to read this whole gigantic thing. I'm just going to give you the tidbits and uh, just See how you want to take it, and maybe that'll lead you to um, some more of your search. It says in this um, book, It is also said that Philo, in the reign of Claudius, became acquainted at Rome with Peter, who was then preaching there. Nor is this indeed improbable for the work of which we have spoken and which was composed by him some years later clearly contains those rules of the church which are even to this day observed among us. And let me let little Sunny out. She's scratching at the door. Sorry, guys. Okay, Sunny, get outside. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, sorry guys, this little sunny Jack Russell dog is killing me. Um, it says, and since he describes as accurately as possible the life of our ascetics, it is clear that he not only knew, but that he was also approved while he venerated and extolled the apostolic men of his time, who were, as it seems, of the Hebrew race, and hence observed after the manner of the Jews the most of the customs of the ancients. In the work to which he gave the title on a contemplative life, after affirming in the first place that he will add to those things which he is about to relate nothing contrary to truth or of his own invention, he says that these men were called their putai, and the women that were with them their pre-tribes. 
He then adds the reason for such a name, explaining it from the fact that they applied remedies, healed the souls of those who came to them by relieving them like physicians, of evil passions, or from the fact that they served and worshiped the deity in purity and sincerity. Eusebius says whether Philo himself gave them this name, employing an epithet well suited to their mode of life, or whether the first of them really called themselves so in the beginning. Since the name of Christians was not yet everywhere known, we need not discuss here, Eusebius says. So, but wait, I thought that Christian was based off of Jesus the Christ and that everyone from the 30s on were called Christians. But Philo says, I mean, Eusebius says that... They called themselves, or their names were Christians, was not yet everywhere known. We need not discuss here. He bears witness, however, that first of all, they renounce their property. When they begin their philosophical mode of life, he says they give up their goods to their relatives and then renouncing all their cares of life. They go forth beyond the walls and dwell in lonely fields and gardens, knowing well that intercourse with people of a different character is unprofitable and harmful. They did this at the time, as seems probable, under the influence of a spirit and ardent faith, practicing in emulation the prophet's mode of life. Now, for in the Acts of the Apostles, a work universally acknowledged as authentic. You see how he puts that in there? Universally acknowledged as authentic. It is recorded that all the companions of the Apostles sold their possessions and their property and distributed to all according to the necessity of each one so that no one among them was in want. And let me let Sonny in. Come on, Sonny. Anyone want a Jack Russell puppy? Okay, so then, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses, as the account says, sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet, so that distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. Now, Philo bears witness to the facts, very much like those here described, and then adds the following count. Everywhere in the world is this race found. Now, this is Philo. And barbarian should share in what is perfectly good. But the race particularly abounds in Egypt. Hallelujah to the moon god, y'all. Now, you know, so they're saying that everywhere in the world is this race found. This particular group. For it was fitting that both the Greeks and the barbarians should share in what is perfectly good. And this race was found in Egypt and in each of its so-called gnomes or parishes or counties per se and especially in Alexandria. The best man from every quarter, as if to a colony of the Therapeutes fatherland, to a certain very suitable spot which lies above the lake 
Mauro or Maria. Upon a low hill, excellently situated on account of its security and the mildness of the atmosphere. Now, going on a little further, he states, Eusebius, after describing the kinds of houses which they had, he speaks as follows concerning their churches. Their churches. Their putai. Egyptian churches. When are we going to blow the lid off? Which were scattered here and there. In each house, there is a sacred apartment which is called a sanctuary and monastery. And you want to know where the monks came in? The monks, the friars, because they saw the ascetics that the Therapeutai Egyptians were doing, the Essene, Nazarenes, and they stole the concept. And it's really perverted now. Where quite alone they perform the mysteries of their religious life. They bring nothing into it, neither drink nor food, nor any of the other things which contributes to the necessities of the body, but only the laws and the inspired oracles of the prophets, hymns, and such other things as making perfect their knowledge and piety. For they read the holy scriptures and explain the philosophy of their fathers in an allegorical manner regarding the written words as symbols of hidden truth, which is communicated in obscure figures. Okay, so written words as symbols of hidden truth. Would it be hieroglyphs? of the sacred writings. Only the high priest knew what the hieroglyphs said. They also have writings of ancient men. Now listen to this. They have also writings of ancient men who were the founders of their sect and who left many monuments of the allegorical method. These they use as models and imitate their principles. Ancient men, thousands of years before the Therapeutai, were the founders and left many monuments. What monuments would that be in Egypt? The temples. The houses of life. You know, that has a heart and a cross on it. You know, the same symbolisms as these pictures of Jesus or Mary and they have the heart, the sacred heart. You know, they had what you call the house of life in Egypt. Go look it up. You know, D.M. Murdoch, the um, mysticist that has passed a few years ago, wrote a book and um, had that in there. These things seem to have been stated by a man who had heard them expounding their sacred writings, but it's highly probable that the works of the ancients, which he says they had, were the gospels and the writings of the apostles, and probably some expositions of the ancient prophets, such as are contained in the epistles to the Hebrews and in many others of Paul's epistles. No such thing as a Paul. It's a made up character more than likely by Josephus as himself. 
There was a real Saul, though, people, in the antiquities of the Jews. Saul, Costabarus, had a brother. And Saul had a son named Philip. And Costabarus and Saul, the brothers, were the ringleaders of the Jews. Now, if you don't believe me, I challenge you to go check out the book, Josephus's Antiquities of the Jews by William Winston that I have studied quite a lot. And if you turn in the back of the book for your players, it says Saul, but no Paul, no Peter, no Barnabas, So moving forward, having laid down temperament, temperance as a sort of foundation in the soul, they build upon it other virtues, this Egyptian therapeutic. None of them may take food or drink before sunset, since they regard uh, philosophy as a work worthy of the light. But attention to the wants of the body is proper only in the darkness, and therefore assign the day to the former but to the latter, a small portion of the night. But if after these things, anyone still absently persists in denying the reference, let him renounce his incredulity and be convinced by yet more striking examples which are to be found nowhere else than in the evangelical religion of the Christians. Uh, hello! Did Nurse J break it down to you? You see, you have to have a starting point. You know, if something smells fishy or it looks fishy, then it must be a fishy. LOL, ha ha. <clears throat> so, now I never said I was a comedian, but the thing of it is, you just can't have something on your plate, okay? And you go, oh, well, cool, what is this? You're thinking to yourself, where does this start? I mean, like, if we really went, like, for the food processing business, you have your can of peas, right? Well, it's got to be farmed or GMO'd. And it's got to go through a process. It's got to be planted or DNA confirmed in the lab. And then it goes through the washing process and chemical process and flavoring process. And then it gets canned. And then it gets shipped on a truck, and then the truck's got to ship it to the store, and then we go to the store. Same concept. Where the hell is my piece coming from? Same thing with religion. Where the hell is this thing coming from? You know, we were born in, we're born to our parents, and our parents took us to this church that they were in when they were younger, or maybe not, or changed denominations. So therefore, we are put in a situation to where that's what we're eating. But when we come to realize how this has happened and we start thinking for ourselves, we must find where this is coming from. And you see this. You've got to love him in some respects and hate his guts the second because he tells you truths and then he lies. And he just says that the Therapeutai Egyptians from Alexandria had monasteries 
and they had churches and they had religious rites and they read from their fathers who are their fathers and then he says striking examples which are to be found nowhere else than in the evangelical religion of the Christians. But not only were the therapeutic Christians are, per se, the Gnostics. So, think about this. If the Catholics are calling themselves Christians, then why were they persecuting and killing the Christians in the first and second and third century? Or even later than that. Has that even registered in your mind? 2019, we're sitting in a church and we're calling ourselves, praise God, Christians. Hallelujah. But the church was killing Christians, so basically they were killing our forefathers? Doesn't make a bit of sense, does it? Because... The Christians that they were killing were the Eastern peoples. The peoples that believed in a different way of just your religious organizations. Egyptian philosophy, Egyptian Ka and the Ba and the reincarnation or the resurrection of the spirit. How to beat the demiurge. Gnosticism. If you want to read the Nag Hammadi scriptures, <laughs> The Gnostics, which are called Christians, they're Jews. They're a Jewish sect. They weren't even what you call today's Christians. They were a totally separate group. They had a lot of different thinking. Go read it. It will make you want to go back to Egyptian spirituality. And that's what I go by. The laws of Ma'at. The Egyptian proverb states, Man, know thyself. That the kingdom is within you. And then you go to Luke and it says that Jesus said, that you will not see the kingdom coming with observation. The kingdom is within you. Doesn't that make you feel so much better? That you can actually throw that thing in the trash? Now let's see what else Eusebius has to stay has to say. Okay, let's see here what he said here. These things the above mentioned Arthur has related in his own work about Eusebius, indicating a mode of life which has been preserved to the present time by us alone. Recording especially the vigils kept in connection with the great festival and the exercises performed during those vigils and the hymns customarily recited by us 
and describing how while one sings regularly in time, the others listen in silence and join in chanting only the clothes of the hymns and how on the days referred to thy sleep on the ground on beds of straw. To use in his own words, taste no wine at all, nor any flesh, but water is their only drink, and their wish with their bread is salt and hyssop. No wine and no flesh. Kind of makes me think of John the Baptist. Seen it much? In addition to this, Philo describes the order of dignities which exist among those who carry on the services of the church, mentioning the diaconate and the office of bishop, which takes the precedence over all the others. But whosoever desires a more accurate knowledge of these matters may get it from the history already cited. But that Philo... When he wrote these things, had in view the first heralds of the Gospels and the customs handed down from the beginning by the apostles is clear to everyone. This is Eusebius' words. Now, what is funny about the footnotes, and this is right out of the Catholic Church. The little bibliographies, the little footnotes. This tradition that Philo met Peter in Rome and form of an acquaintance with him is repeated by Jerome, the lion sucker that wrote the Latin Vulgate. And by Poetus, who even goes further and says directly that Philo became a Christian. The tradition however, must be regarded as quite worthless. It is absolutely certain from Philo's own works and from the otherwise numerous traditions of antiquity that he was never a Christian. And aside from the report of Eusebius, there exists no hint of such a meeting between Peter and Philo. And when we realize that Philo was already an old man in the time of Caius, and that Peter certainly did not reach Rome before the later years of Nero's reign, we may say that such a meeting, as Eusebius records, is certainly not historical. Where Eusebius got this information, we do not know. It may have been manufactured in the interest, or it may have been a natural outgrowth of the ascription of the work to him. Let's see what else it says. Okay. Various opinions as to the identity have been held since that time. The commonest being that they were Jewish sect or school parallel with the Palestinian Essenes, hello, or that they were an outgrowth of Alexandrian Neo-Pythagoranism. The former opinion may be said to have been the prevailing one among Christian scholars until Lucius. So, folks, are you liking this information? 
And it says that assuming then the correctness of Lucius' conclusions, we see that Eusebius was quite right in identifying the therapeutae with the Christian monks as he knew them in his day, but that he was quite wrong in accepting the Philonic authorship of the work in question. Oh, I hope you've enjoyed this information. And as usual, God Thoth gives me the insight and the intuition to figure out what to bring to you next. So as always, Nurse J says, Hotep, Ashe, and have a great day, guys. Goodbye.